welcome Dean Bruce Willison and Mr. Jack Welch. Mm -hmm. And you want to be around people that really have stuff coming out of them that want to 
one of three things. It can be quiet, it can be short, fat, tall, uh, short, with hair, without hair. <laughs> they, they come in all forms, so I'm not trying to get a better package here that's all identical, but I'm trying to get characteristics in, in the inner soul that are the same. Uh, this is a school that prides itself on uh, entrepreneurial leaders and training uh, entrepreneurs, but not just for startup companies, even for large companies. But uh, can you tell us about how you try to instill in a very complex organization, large organization, the uh, spirit of entrepreneurship? We desperately <clears throat> ask people to constantly look, be looking and identifying what we call in the book, in the book winning, the aha. What is your the aha? that can find the niche that you can execute in, and then putting our best people on it. The thing you got to do in, an, in, in a corporate setting in an entrepreneur's life, it's, it's a little more difficult for you sat in your own, is to over-resource it. It's so much harder to build a company from 500000 to run a company that's got $500,000 in sales, than it is to run one with $500 million in sales. One has got systems in place, process in place. At five hundred thousand, you're starting from scratch. You've got to have great people. You've got to be over resourced. You've got to staff it as if it's five hundred million or five billion, because it's so, such a much harder job. It's like starting a business in a, in a far foreign country as, as you go there. It's so much harder than starting from the headquarters. So you've always got to over over staff in terms of qualifications. Over uh, resource in terms of dollars and let them have their hand. Although we say in this book, it's a little bit like the child in, in school, your, your, your old, oldest child. Uh, they go away, uh, away to school and you uh, sort of let them go until they get their first drunken driving charge or some other <laughs> man behavior and you pull the tether back in again. You do the same thing with, 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 a, with, a, new, with a new venture. You give them their hand, you give them the dollars, and every now and then you yank it over the bed and go back and start again. Now, one, one of the uh, questions in terms of uh, particularly comments you made in your last book about your own ambition and drive, uh, you talked about how that impacted others. H how do you work the balance between being politically savvy about your own career and your company and wearing your ambition on your sleeve uh, to ill effect? Well, I think that when you get, get out in, in the workplace, there will be three things I think that will determine your success initially. And that will be your ability to over-deliver. You can never just deliver, you've got to over-deliver if you want to be a star. Because your boss always, when, when they ask you for a, a question, they always have the answer. They're just <laughs> looking, looking for the confirmation from you. So your job is to always give them new perspectives they never had. So in, in the response to the request, broaden the answer. Make the answer as wide as you can so that your boss goes back with real insights. Uh, secondly, I think you've got to have a positive attitude. I, I can't stress it enough. People want people that can have a candle. I don't mean a sunny personality that's uh, dancing around with reality, but I mean a, a can-do can personality. And finally, you, if you've got tons of ambition, which I want you to have, don't wear it in a neon light on your forehead. <laughs> Keep it to yourself and try and, and, and work within the frame, for framework of the team as you deliver, as you over deliver the goods. Because one of the problems you face is with talented people that are in this room, there's the eagerness of fast promotions. There's the, you know, uh, what have you done to me lately uh, type of thing. And so you've got to. Just over the limit, it will take care of itself. If you're really good, and you are making your team and your boss look good, it'll take care of itself, I guarantee you, in any good company. A uh, final question before the audience, a uh, CEO question. Uh, even since you uh, took off your CEO hat, a lot has changed this balance of power between the board and maybe some of the outside influence, like auditors and lawyers. Um, how do you think? Corporate America is uh, is going through this process now. Uh, do you think that uh, you and some other CEOs would have an uncomfortable time with uh, what's happening in the board today? Well, I don't think in great companies it's happening that, that much. I think uh, I think without question the corporate America brought it on itself. 
So let's just face it, soybeans obviously is a, will, was a well-meaning uh, uh, act to deal with some transgressions that were crazy to get things back in line and get investors' confidence. Obviously, in anything that passes the Senate 99 to nothing, something's wrong with it. So there's a bit of an, uh, an over extreme. I am worried a little bit the fact that boards are forgetting what their jobs are. The board's job is to pick the CEO, to understand the vision, to be sure that the company is operating uh, effectively t towards that, and to move and in order to do that, it's not to sit in boardrooms and pour through papers. We send our board to the field five, six times a year without us to climb around factories, to go to dinner with managers. We did that in the mid-90s. And they did it for six years, seven years while I was there. The board has to go out and touch and feel real people doing real things and not look at how could a board member show up uh, ten times a year for four hours and a big lunch uh, to look at balance sheets of multinational uh, uh, banks, for example. People are trading uh, uh, euros for, for yen uh, all over in the middle of the night. These guys are in there with the books. It's crazy. So micromanaging, micromanaging by boards is nothing but trouble. Uh, and I'll give you a case in point. Uh, I think without question, the colleague be or anything, uh, whether, whether you agree or not with the job she did or whatever happened, that board telling her who to put in what job is outrageous. Absolutely outrageous. Her job was to be CEO and to pick the team that was going to win. And their job is to help her win. If she can't do it, then take her out. But tell her how to win is not the board's role. And if you see boards do, do, doing that, stay away from the company. It's a lousy place to go. Great. Well, let's uh, open it up and uh, please stand uh, and identify yourself so we can get a microphone to you. So we have a question there. Oh, yes, please. Do you hear? Please stand up uh, when you, uh, you want to ask a question. Uh, thanks, Mr. Welsh, for, for coming to UCLA Anderson. It's terrific to see you here. Um, my question keys off the, the um, executive board relationships that the dean was, was talking about. What do you think of the, the excesses in executive computation, compensation, Jack? Um, specifically, Dennis Kozlowski, Mike Eisner, probably just got the, the $22 million service package from HP. How does corporate America go about bringing this in line with, with normal standards? Well, first of all, let's, did anybody get the question? It's why I see he was getting so much skin money. <laughs> let, me, let me try and deal with it. Um, there is no way I'm going to sit up here in front of you and tell you the absolute level of this right or wrong. I'm saying that free markets, in fact, uh, are the greatest system in the world, and supply and demand has, in fact, driven a certain way. But let's take the colleague theory that $22 million in severance uh, after being fired. That's the problem of a lousy board to stop it. The board, the board, listen, the board has a job, it's just the succession plan for the CEO. And when these things break down and there's no internal successor, because the company didn't have a development process and wasn't building options to pick from, they have to go outside and they have to go buy the CEO. Now, what CEO is going to sit out there and then go to a place without getting a deal? So they go for the deal and the deal says, and if I don't do a good job, I will not perish you or else I'm not going to go. So the board hasn't done any succession work at all. The classic case is GE. Let's take the GE case. <laughs> The three people left for the, for the job, Jeff Jump in, in out, <coughs> the fellow who finally got the job, Bob Nadelli, who went off to run Home Depot, and Jim McNerney, that went off to run a 3M. All three are doing a fabulous job. Guess what? Who do you think is making the most money? The guy who won a GE or the other two? 
The other two. The other two are making almost three times, in some cases, what Imhal's making. Why? Because 3M had no one. And they had to go buy McMurray. Home Depot had no one. They had to go buy Nardelli. GE just gave Jeff a raise. <laughs> successes and they blew him out of there. And now we gotta go replace him. Now the thing looks like it's going to a vortex and sinking. Ed Green is the number two guy at Motorola. Great reputation. He had run uh, General Instrument. The Tyco board now is panicked. They've got no one, the stock is disintegrating. What do they do? They gotta go get Ed Green. So they gotta get a Brinks truck, drive out to Chicago, <laughs> back it up. Say, come on, Ed, join up. <laughs> That's how it works. And, you know, I can go through, that, 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 there's another I, I, like the ratio of CEO pay to the lowest work through 435 to 1, 521 to 1, or it used to be this. Look, who's going to set the ratio? A government? How the hell could a congressman set the ratio of the pay? And let's look at Alex Rodriguez, the third baseman of the Yankees. Is anybody saying, Alex, you're playing third base here now. The, the hot dog vendor is making... <laughs> <laughs> it's a free market. It's one says sometimes they're wrong, but that's the way it is. Excuse me. Hi there. Uh, I'm a recent Anderson alum about three years ago, and I started a business where we have a couple million dollars in revenue, and one of our biggest, biggest challenges is exactly what you mentioned, is identifying these people. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about identifying people to bring into the company to be these leaders and to be these executors in the company, and then also continuing to develop them once they're there, evaluating them and training them, and building them into better leaders. Well, clearly, you've got to find out your own screen as to what works. I went through that 4 e thing I talked about before. Or it worked for me. Uh, I finally could get enough information from that that it worked. If I'm hiring from the outside, I want to know so much about why the person is leaving the last job. That's the best question I can ask. And I want to sit back after I ask him that and let him talk. And I want to listen to him. And I want to probe a little more and say, you mean the boss wasn't that good? Or, and give me some more. You can learn more in the interviewing process by asking why the departure. Why would you be willing to come here even? What is wrong with where you are? So you can get a feel for the energy in the place. And the guy said, look, I, I was in a place, I liked it, but I can do more here. I want to be able to start in a different development enterprise. I can deliver this, this, and this to you. You'll know. You'll know they'll be right across from you, eyes glaring at you, passion in their, in their voice, wanting the game. And you've got to sit there and you want them to just want it. That's, that, that's how to do their training. In evaluation, you know, I, I have this system that I propose, which is somewhat controversial, uh, called differentiation. And uh, I believe in it to my toes. I, I believe that uh, there is a top 20, roughly. I'm talking directionally now. There is a middle of the company, the middle 70. Uh, the top 20, when you want to love, kiss, make, make them grow, you want to give them everything. You want them to know they're the best, the mid middle 70. You want them to know they can be in the top 20. They've got a chance to do this, this, and this. And you tell them why. And then I got a bottom 10. I just think they're going to go. <laughs> and they don't have to be fired. The great thing is, if you take the bottom 10, and you tell them they're in the bottom 10, <laughs> and you lay out why they're there, they will go. No one, no one wants to hang around in the bottom ten. Now you can have a system that gives them two or three percent increases. That they, as a head fake, it confuses them. Okay, because you, because you're a kind manager. Let me tell you, any one of you that keeps non-performance isn't a kind manager. You're a cowardly, weak manager. And anyone that parades around with that story of Kindness and journalists go out of their mind when they talk like this. They go out of their minds over this discussion. You are doing them a favor.
Because you think you do it when they're early in their career, when anybody graduating from here has got options. So let them know where they can, what's wrong with them here, but they can go elsewhere and they can grow and do things. And so what is the worst thing in the world that, that, that occurs when, when you don't have evaluation system? What is the worst thing that happens is a recession comes or a downturn comes. The boss comes striding, the kind boss, the kind boss. He comes striding into the office and says, Mary Joe, you both have to leave now. We're going to cut costs. We're going to get 15% of the cost up. Mary Joe said, why us? Because you weren't very good. Well, why didn't you tell us? We've been here 23 years. <laughs> that's what happens. And that's why people are uh, disgusted with corporate America at times. That's why there's disgruntlement. That's why there's all these things. Uh, I was at a... Uh, I was at a radio show this morning. Uh, no, I uh, guess it was a TV show. I did two or three things this morning. Uh, I was at a TV show, and the, and the, the, the anchor, after the show was over, said, I, this damn place we worked in, he said, we're doing great, and our ratings are good, but they keep telling us that because the current company's having problems, we can't get a raise. Uh, I mean, come on. That's, that's the lamest thing known to man. That's a lousy man. I see a lousy manager with a lousy excuse that isn't candid with you. You want to be open and candid with every employee. You as a leader, every one of you that graduates from here, as you lead a, a, a group of people, you have the obligation to let them know where they stand. You have that obligation. That's what leadership's about. So nobody can be surprised about anything that happens in your place. And you ask about training and, and, and developing. I always, for four times a year at least, I would write on a piece of paper what I like about what, what you're doing and what you can improve. A little scrap of paper with a left and a right hand column. Uh, I did it every time they got a raise, every time they got a bonus, every time they got a stock option in the annual appraisal plan. That was a minimum of four. You have to keep doing that. You have to keep telling people, what, and have they approved from the last time you told them what they need to approve? So that you always have this dialogue between you that's open as to where they stand and how well, how well they do. If you do that, you'll just build a great team. I'll guarantee it. And by the way, there's more complete answers about the evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell them today in one of your chapters here at the book. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Walsh. It's an honor. I uh, will GE Commercial Finance. G Capital. Got the pleasure of working the, underneath you for two years. Um, my question is, in capital these days, in finance, we talk a lot about, uh, especially me in finance sales, <clears throat> your biggest sale is not just in front of the customer, ACFC, which Mr. Rimmel just talked a lot about being in front of the customer, but we talk a lot about the internal sell. You have to sell yourself to GE too, so I've got two sales jobs. And my question is, is what is your best advice for moving ahead, getting that next job that you want, Assuming you're doing all the right things, you're, you're overperforming and all that stuff, what is the best advice, the simplest advice for, for getting that next job? You've just said it. I mean, if you're over-delivering and they're not responding to you, you have to have a di dialogue about, look, here's what I've done, and am I going to get something missed? And then if you're over-delivering, you, you feel very, pretty good about yourself. If they don't smarten up and, and move you along, you've got to take matters in your own hand and move on. But if you're over delivering, I bet that you're going to find out that you're going to get taken care of. Now, you've got to be sure that you're really over delivering. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a deal you and your mirror have to make. But clearly, that is the answer. I mean, it is without question the answer, because then you've got something to lay in front of your boss about, hey, this, where do I go from here? Let's talk about my career. And if your boss isn't doing that with you in frequent, on a frequent interval, and then I'm doing their job and we're challenge them on it. And you've got enough stuff here now that you can pack up and go elsewhere if you can do a work not right here. I always told everybody in G, no one's here at gunboat. Everybody's here. We want, we want to excite you. We, we, we want you to stay more, more than anything in the world. We want you to love the place. But if we're not delivering for you, I hope you'll take it into your own hands. Because if, if we find out that three or four of you have gone, and you're good, we'll find out you had a bad boss. And so, from my point of view, it's healthy when good people are always challenging the system and uh, taking that mess in their own hands if they have to. But generally, you know, you don't have to. Generally, if you're over the, the doing and a good human resource system, you'll make out. Thank you. Mr. Wells, under your leadership,
leadership, General Electric uh, hit a home run uh, internationally. Uh, what was the greatest challenge you faced in doing that? Initially, uh, in the 80s, it was real hard getting uh, great people to want to go to tough locations. Uh, and the second thing is, once they got there, the Europeans were able to use bribery uh, in their deals to get a tax deduction for bribery, which is an outrageous thing, but that's the way the laws were. So our people would be losing orders depending on where they were, and always come back and say, we can't get an order because of bribery. In the end, we, we believed, and it turned out to be true, that in the end, people will want to do big business with you because they, they know you're not bribing, and it'll be the good housekeeping social approval. And that turned out to be true in the, in, in the Middle East in particular, where it was rampant with bribery uh, in the early days. Now, it's very difficult to do any big business in Nigeria and some of these places where, where corruption is rampant. Uh, but uh, if you stay on, on course and put your best people there, uh, it worked out fine o over time. People in the end, you know, it's interesting about corruption. People in the end, if you get a company where bribery is legal, you don't know about your own people. Because if they're bribing somebody, you have no idea about their kickbacks from the bribe. So if the whole the whole thing becomes corrupt. And I, as I've talked to, to European CEOs, they didn't like it. They didn't even like what they had. Because they couldn't tell at different levels of their organization who was straight. It was a very difficult thing to do. So bribery is a, is a lot more complex than it looks like because your own organization gets corrupted as well as the organization that you're dealing with. But the biggest thing is making sure that going on foreign assignment isn't goodbye. It's the beginning of a career, not the end of a career. So you would have to, even if you made a mistake on a couple of people who had fought foreign assignments in the early days, you had to give them promotions on the way back, not leave them out there waving to them. Uh, <laughs> and so, Jack, do you recommend that uh, early on in your career that you look for opportunities to have international assignments? I think you should do anything uh, that goes along with a company's thrust. If your company is trying to globalize and participate in China as one of its key elements of success, you want to jump on that bandwagon. Band if your company is adopting Six Sigma as a quality drive, you want to take charge of one of the uni the uni units doing it. You get disability. You have a chapter on what, on what about getting promoted. One of the main ways of getting promoted is to go where the action is for the company. So if the company is expanding globally, Bruce, you want to get there and go do it. If the company is driving a new quality initiative in a big way, get on there because the people at Bank America who have taken on a big six to sigma drive, the early proponents of that are getting big promotions in the bank. Including Lee McGee, who's on our board visitors. Is that right? <laughs> Questions? Yes. I, I was wondering, uh, when you were Growing up, who were your role models, and, and also like when you were fresh out of school, um, what were your short-term goals and your long-term goals? Well, my uh, short-term goal when I got out of school was to make up my money to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had no great ambitions. I just went and did a job. I, I did pick a job in a place where I, I was an entrepreneur within a big company. I was the first employee of what's called the plastics division. Today. It's now a several billion dollar business, but when, when I was there, we had no sales. Uh, I was the first employee, if you will, uh, and taking lab products to the marketplace. And uh, so I was an emperor, king, anytime you want to give me, I had it for that first job. And I was trying to build a business, but I had a bank supporting me. It's much easier to do it where I was doing it than perhaps where you're doing it on, on your own, which is much tougher. Uh, my, uh, my role models have always been um, many. Uh, I go to a place and I'll see somebody that, and I'll tell you this now, don't go to a company and ever get a mentor. You don't want a mentor. Because your mentor, if, if you look at, people are so interested in going to get a mentor. If you want a mentor, get one that shows you where the cafeteria is. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because you'll never, yeah. don't, don't forget, you get shot in the process. Your mentor may not be any good. And all of a sudden, you're tabbed as the mentee with that mentor. You want 10 mentors. You want to have somebody that's good in human resources, uh, should, can get the best out of them, somebody better than you in finance, get the best out of them, somebody in leadership that turns you on. Follow them, watch them out, how they do it. You want business magazines to be your mentor. Uh, Fortune, Business Week, Forbes, you can't read them and I never miss one. It shocks me. The kids graduate and don't have subscriptions, don't live in the Wall Street Journal to really understand the rhythm of their business. Now, you have to have your own opinions of the deals and who did what and whether the deal was right. And the, and the magazines won't, won't always be right, but you can form your views of the deal they tried to make and put together, whether it worked or didn't work. There's so many ways to get mentoring. And it's not from one mentor. So all these programs say, if you come to our company, we'll give you a mentor. Say, get me out of here. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, in today's global economy, uh, so many companies have, uh, you know, uh, companies, factories outside of U.S. And uh, there is so much of a cultural mix within the companies. Uh, as a CEO of uh, GE, how did you handle, you know, so many cultures, so many different people at, at uh, the leadership uh, in those countries? And uh, what was your experience like? Look, I think our values were very clear. Voice and dignity for every employee. Independent of the stripes on your shoulder. You had, you had an opportunity to speak up. You were welcome to that. That was a value. And if you spoke up, we rewarded that. We wanted that. Uh, that voice and dignity works in any country. Now, you may have to go at a different pace with candid appraisals, but in general, a value to, to differentiation, candor, they work in any culture. People welcome it. When we first did, did it in Japan, everyone was panicked for it. It worked fine. In India, it works fine. Uh, in the calls of picking the back, people want the best to be rewarded, and people don't want you to carry weak people. In any culture, they don't want you to carry weak people. Everyone knows who isn't delivering. And the longer you go in the organization, the more they know. The more, because they have, it's, it's almost like, like this. The higher you go in the organization, you give orders, and other people row the boat. Okay? So if there are six on each side of a boat rowing a, 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 a crew, okay? And two of them on one side aren't rowing. The boat goes right around like this, and the people on there is hell, but the people are not rowing. That happens every day in business. We ran uh, surveys, and we had a reputation of sorts as being some of the hot ass, and we ran uh, a sur surveys for 15 years, blind surveys. And the question was, do you think we are <clears throat> straightforward and rigorous enough with uh, all employees? The higher you went in the company, the satisfaction rate was, in fact, finally meets 95%, which you know, you don't get down on a dental plan. Uh, but in, 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 the, in the lower in the organization, it took us 15 years to get to 50%. Because they know who's coming in late, who isn't doing something, who isn't pulling their weight, and that can be in any culture. People want to deal with the people that aren't doing their fair share of the work. So. Candid, open, as long as it's open, as long as people think it's transparent and fair, it's okay. The minute they don't feel that, and then it's cronyism and other things, you run into trouble. But if you, if you keep holding an organization, and the, one of the great things about the, the internet is the online frequent surveys, and you don't ask about the food or the parking lot, you ask about things you really want to know. Are they is that are the words from the top being felt at the bottom or in the middle? And you'll see the big, wide variety and dispersion of, of information. All right, we have time for one more question. Yes, hi, I'm Mark Rockford. Um In this age of information, how do you deal with misinformation and over-information? How do you sort through all, um, all the information sources that you have? A hell of a lot better than you did when you didn't have any. <laughs> I mean, you, you now have information in your hands to be able, if you're going to have a transparent organization, 
you can see what they're doing and what they're not doing. And if it matches what you're seeing, you can deal with it very effectively. But I am all for more information. Now, I'm not for reply to all on every email, so I'm, I'm not suggesting that. But I am suggesting a relentless open book, if you will, on what the strategy is, what the plan plans are. And, it, and if, you have a, if you have eight people in your row there, if you've got two that have done an outstanding job, give them a management award. Now, the argument against that will be, well, what do I tell the other six? That's weak management. If you can't give two of them an award because you can't explain to the other six, then you shouldn't give them the award. But you always have to be able to give, to deliver to people uh, celebrations for what they did and what they've accomplished. And, 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 so, and business has to be fun. You've got to constantly be working towards doing that. And if you're open and transparent about it, and you, and, you, and you can explain it then, you can explain it to why you're doing that that way. So I'm, I'm a huge believer in more information being disseminated to more people, and you then being able to justify the action you are taking, because everybody has a full deck. Thank you, we'll turn it back to you. First, I take, can, can I just thank you all, I wish we had more time, this is more fun than I can imagine.